The one and only Ivan, part 11. How? It takes a long time, but finally Ruby returns to sleep. Ivan, Bob whispers, yawning, what you said about the zoo. How are you going to do it? Suddenly, I feel as if I could sleep for a thousand days. I don't know, I admit. You'll think of something, Bob says, confidently, his voice trailing off as his eyes close. What if I don't, I ask, but Bob is already asleep. His little red feet dance, and I know he's running in his dreams, remembering. Bob and Ruby sleep on. I don't sleep. I think about the promise I made to Stella and the pictures I've made for Ruby, and I remember, I remember it all. What they did. We were clinging to our mother, my sister and I, when the humans killed her. They shot my father next. Then they chopped off their hands, their feet, their heads. Something else to buy. There is a cluttered, musty store near my cage. They sell an ashtray there. It is made from the hand of a gorilla. Another Ivan. When morning comes and the parking lot glimmers with dew, I see the billboard on the highway. There I am. The one and only Ivan. Bathed in the pink light of dawn, I look so angry with my furrowed brow and clenched fists. I look the way my father did the day the men came. I am, I suppose, a peaceful sort. Mostly I watch the world go by and think about naps and bananas and yogurt raisins, but inside me, hidden, is another Ivan. He could tear a grown man's limbs off his body. In the flicker of time it takes a snake's tongue to taste the air, he could taste revenge. He is the Ivan on the billboard. I stare at the one and only Ivan, at the faded picture of Stella, and I remember George and Mac on their ladders, adding the picture of Ruby to bring new pi adding the picture of Ruby to bring new visitors to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade. I remember the story Ruby told, the one where the villagers came to her rescue. I hear Stella's kind, wise voice. Humans can surprise you sometimes. I look at my fingers, coated in red paint, the color of blood, and I know how to keep my promise. Days. During the days, I wait. During the nights, I paint. I worry when Mac takes Ruby into the ring. He carries the claw stick with him all the time now. He doesn't use it. He doesn't have to. Ruby isn't fighting back anymore. She does whatever Mac asks. Nights. I close my eyes, I dip my fingers into the paint. When I'm done with one piece of paper, I set it aside to dry. It's so small, just one sheet, and I'm going to need so many. I move on to the next and the next and the next. It's a giant puzzle, and I'm making the pieces one by one. By morning, my floor is covered with paintings. I hide the paintings under my pool of dirty water before Mac can see them. I don't want them to end up in the gift store selling for $20 a piece. 25 with frame. These paintings are for Ruby, every one of them. Project. Ivan Ruby asks one morning when I am trying to nap, why are you always so sleepy during the day? I've been working on a project at night, I tell her. What's a project? It's a thing, a painting. It's a painting for you, actually, I answer. Ruby looks pleased. Can I see it? Not yet. Ruby pokes with annoyance at her roped foot. She takes a breath. Ivan, do I have to do the shows with Mac today? I'm afraid so. I'm sorry, Ruby. Ruby dips her trunk in her water bucket. That's okay, she says. I already knew the answer. Not right. It's night again and everyone's asleep. I look at the picture I've just made. One of dozens. It's smudged and torn, a muddy blur. I place it beside the others lining my floor. The colors are wrong, the shapes are off, it looks like nothing. It's not what I'm trying to create, it's not what it's meant to be, it's not right, and I don't know why. Across the parking lot, the billboard beckons, as it always does, Come to the Exit 8 Big Top Mall and Video Arcade, home of the one and only Ivan Mighty Silverback. If I could use human words to say what I need to say, this would all be so easy. Instead, I have my pots of paint and my ragged pages. I sigh, my fingertips glow like jungle flowers. I try again. Going nowhere. I watch Ruby plod around the ring in endless circles, going nowhere. 
More visitors have been coming, but not many. Max says Ruby's not picking up the slack after all. He says he's cutting back on her food. He says he's turning off the heat at night to save money. Ruby looks thinner to me, more wrinkled than Stella ever was. Do you think Ruby's eating enough, I ask Bob? I don't know. I'll tell you one thing, though. You're sure as heck painting enough, Bob wrinkles his nose. That stench is unbelievable, and I found yellow paint on my tail this morning. Bob isn't happy about my night painting. He says it's unnatural. Now, while I work at my art, Bob sleeps on knot tag. He claims he prefers her because she doesn't snore. He says her belly doesn't rise and fall and make him seasick. What is this plan of yours anyway, Bob asks. If you explained it to me, I could help out. He gnaws at his tail. Maybe I could come up with something that doesn't involve, you know, paint. I can't explain it, I tell him. It's an idea in my head, but I can't get it right. And anyway, I'm almost out of supplies. I should have known I wouldn't have enough. I kick at my tire swing. It's spattered with drops of blue paint. It's a stupid idea. I doubt that, Bob says. Spelling, yes. Stupid? Never. Bad guys. Most of the day I doze. Late in the afternoon, Mac approaches. Bob slips under knot tag. He prefers to keep a low profile around Mac. Mac's gaze falls on my pool. A corner of one of my paintings is visible. What's that big guy, he asks. I calmly eat an orange, ignoring him, but my heart is racing. Mac kicks at my plastic pool. Underneath it are all the paintings. Mac yanks on a piece of paper. It slips out easily, and he doesn't seem to notice the other paintings. The page is striped with green, which is what happens when blue paint and yellow paint get together. It's supposed to be a patch of grass. Not bad. Where'd you get the paint anyway? George's kid? He considers, hmm, I bet I can get... 30 for this picture, maybe even 40. Mac turns on my TV. It's a Western. There's a human with a big hat and a small gun. He has a shiny, st a shiny star pinned to his chest. That means he is the sheriff, and he will be getting rid of all the bad guys. If this sells quick, I'm getting you some more of that paint, buddy, Mac says. He walks away with my painting, Ruby's painting. For a moment, I imagine what it would feel like to be the sheriff. Add. Good news, huh? Bob says when Max out of earshot. Looks like you might be getting some more supplies. I don't want to paint for Mac, I say. I'm painting for Ruby. You can do both, Bob says. You're an artist, after all. While I watch the movie, I try to come up with a new hiding place for my paintings. Maybe, I think, I could fold them once they're dry and stuff them into knot tag. It's a long movie. At the end, the sheriff marries the woman who owns the saloon, which is a watering hole for humans but not horses. It's been a long time since I've seen a western that was also a romance. I like that movie, I say to Bob. Too many horses, not enough dogs, he comments. An ad comes on. I don't understand ads. They're not like westerns, where you know who the bad guy is supposed to be. And they're hardly ever romantic, unless the man and the woman are brushing their teeth before they face lick. I watch an ad for underarm deodorant. How do you know who's who if they don't smell, I ask Bob. Humans reek. Bob replies, they just don't notice because they have incompetent noses. Another ad comes on. I see children and their parents buying tickets, just like the tickets Max sells. They laugh, enjoying their ice cream cones as they walk down the path. They pause to watch the two they pause to watch two sleepy eyed cats, huge and striped, dozing in long grass. Tigers, I know because I saw them once on a nature show. Words flash on the screen, accompanied by a drawing of a red giraffe. The giraffe vanishes, and I see a human family staring at another kind of family. Elephants, old and young, they're surrounded by rocks and trees and grass and room to wander. It's a wild cage. A zoo. I see where it begins and where it ends. The wall that says, you are this, and we are that, and that is how it will always be. It's not a perfect place. Even in just a few fleeting seconds on my TV screen, I can see that. A perfect place would not need walls. But it's the place I need. I gaze at the elephants, and then I look over at Ruby, small and alone. Before the ad ends, I try to remember every last detail. Rocks, trees, tails, trunks. It's the picture I need to paint. And that's where we'll start. Where we will stop with part 11.